The big headline and buzz today has been on markets hitting lifetime highs. The Sensex crossed the 64,000 mark, while the Nifty scaled 19,000. Today on the show, we're going to talk about what this actually means, why it's such a big story, and why it should matter to you. The Sensex and Nifty are indices that measure the performance of India's top companies. The Sensex has 30 companies in that list, and the Nifty has 50. These levels that have been crossed today are being celebrated because it's happened for the first time since these markets began trade. But it's considered important because the Sensex and Nifty are broadly seen as indicators of how well Indian companies are performing and by extension, how well the Indian economy is doing. But for individuals, it matters simply because you can get better returns from your investments in these companies. So what is driving this increase in markets? Let's go through that first. For one, it's better than expected economic data in the United States that came in. That's made global markets perform better and as an outcome of that, Indian markets are also doing well. There's also hope for inflation coming down faster than was expected earlier. Foreign investors are putting in more money in Indian markets relatively as compared to the last two years. So, for example, foreign investors have spent over $10 billion in India, in the Indian markets, in just the last three months. Arrival of the monsoon and better than expected progress of the monsoon has also been one factor. And crude prices have been lower than anticipated. So, so these are some of the reasons why you've seen this current bout of markets increasing and thus naturally touching these highs. So why is it a big deal and does it really make a difference? Well, let's be honest, new levels for markets in itself have no real impact. It doesn't mean anything much, but it's a huge psychological jump. So it's like a milestone that you hit. New highs are also indicative of investor interest in markets. Growth in markets also reflects confidence in the India story. And important to remember that market levels are dependent on global market movements as well. For investors, they can choose to sell right now their investments and take a profit if they're sitting on a profit or stay invested for the long term. Market highs also indicate consumer sentiment in the economy. That's why it's seen as an important headline. And it reflects hope that Indian companies will increase their profits. This has also started mattering to more and more people and this data is important. India now has more stock market investors than ever before. Either directly through DMAT accounts, that means people who buy and sell in the markets directly, or through mutual funds. This is how people are investing their savings, hoping to beat inflation and get better returns. Just for perspective, the number of DMAT accounts in India rose from 3.59, that means about 3.5 crores, in the year 2018-19 to 11.8 crores in May 2023. That's just in five years. And in the last 10 years, the amount of money that mutual funds are managing has gone from 8.68 trillion rupees in 2013 to 43 trillion rupees, and a little more than that actually, in 2023. So what does this new high actually mean to you if you're an investor, if you put money in the markets and if you're just trying to understand what's going on? I have uh, the best possible speakers on this. Devina Mehra, Managing Director of First Global Group is with me on the show. Monica Allen, author of uh, Let's Talk Money is joining us today. And Ajay Baga, market expert, also speaking with us today. Welcome to all of you and thank you so much for joining us this evening on Beyond the Headline. Um, let me begin with you, uh, Ms. Mehra on what you see as the importance for this, because this is definitely a headline that people will be reading everywhere and wondering, what's the big deal? Why does it matter to me? Uh, hi, Tamanna, and uh, you're right. Uh, you were right when you said that there is only a limited uh, value to the fact that it has reached a new high. The more important thing is that what should you be doing if you have an allocation to equity in your portfolio, or even if you plan to have an allocation to equity in your portfolio. And I had actually tweeted on March 28th when the Sensex, when the Nifty was less than 17,000, that you know, the market, uh, uh, whatever is your equity allocation, you should be putting it in. So if you didn't put it in, then it is still not too late. Of 
or so my market is up 11 12 percent from there and i never say even for a very young person that you should put 100 percent of your assets in equity but whatever you want to put in equity this is not a bad time at all to be doing that and the reason uh, you know why i say that is that oftentimes the retail investors get into the market too late when it has already run up a lot uh, no, and uh, so if you look at even mutual fund inflows, you know, let alone or, or people buying equity directly, if you look at the inflows, total inflows, in the mutual fund, they tend to peak just when the market has gone up and is actually the market is peaking. So don't sit on the sidelines too long because one thing you must understand uh, that while there is a risk to being in the market, there is also a risk to not being invested. So we talk of equity returns being 15, 16% over the long term. But if you miss out a few up days, which in a 40 year history of the census can be as few as 10 up days. So that you know, 100 rupees which you invested in 1979, 80 is supposed to have grown to, I know, last year we looked at, at about 45,000 rupees, but two thirds of those returns disappear if you just miss out 10 good days. So what okay. I find often is that retail investors wait too long, saying I'll wait till things are clearer. And what happens is then the market runs up and then after the market has run up, then they get in and then they don't make money or they lose money. So as I said, whatever you think is a reasonable equity allocation for you, this is the time to invest. And uh, well, some of the reasons you spoke about are correct. Some are not. I mean, I, I don't necessarily agree with all of them. But one of the important reasons why the Indian market actually has done well uh, since that COVID lows, and which I've been talking about right from 2021, is that 2010 to 20 was actually a very bad period for the Indian markets, besides everything else. That was a period when equity, Indian equities barely gave more than fixed deposit returns. So when that market turned, I was quite clear that the Indian market would outperform the global market, which it did. Of course, in 2022 uh, was such a bad year for global markets in all asset markets that even that was not good enough to give you a lot of return, but you know they did outperform. That outperformance will continue, and one of the things which you mentioned, which will help both the Indian economy in terms of inflation, in terms of current account deficit, in terms of GDP growth, and also corporate right. earnings, is the crude price falling from where it was last year. It has come down very substantially, and crude oil means a lot of downstream petrochemical prices also fall. So you will see that impact coming in earnings of companies in the coming quarters uh, right from uh, this quarter, that quarter ending June, you will see an impact of that. Already, uh, you know, we look at valuation ratios like price earning ratio for the Nifty is not very high, which shows that the valuations are not very stretched. So they're like about 22, 22 and a half as compared to mid thirties in 21. Of course, you know, that was a depressed year earnings. And the growth is not bad at all. Even last quarter, while the Nifty earnings growth was about right. 8%, that means the profits on the average grew okay. 8%. If you remove the commodity companies like the steel companies and the oil companies, then the growth was actually close to 25%. So there are all these positives. And as I said, India is still in an outperformance mode. So I, of right. course, also say that you must diversify globally, but uh, keeping that apart for the time being for Indian markets, not not so, a bad time. So, so let's 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 you know, people watching tonight may not be people who are tracking markets constantly, and I'm very aware of that as I speak to people who track markets uh, every second. But those watching may not be you know tracking markets constantly. Would likely have some exposure somewhere or the other, either in some kind of an investment fund or in mutual fund, etc. And others might be liking this headline or listening to this headline and wondering, what does this say about India? Ajay Baga, I'm going to come to you with that question. We often equate markets at highs with a very rosy picture or a positive picture of the Indian economy. Is it truly a barometer of the Indian economy? 
Well, uh, that's a very big uh, discussion topic, and uh, I would say uh, we'll defer it uh, for uh, uh, today. Uh, but uh, Tamanda, the big thing is uh, global growth is a rare commodity. That is what a very dear friend of mine, a very uh, revered fund manager who is in retirement, and I was talking to him this uh, afternoon after the market uh, hit highs, and he says, uh, you know, uh, the global growth. Uh, is a rare commodity, and that is what India is benefiting from. There are good flows coming in, uh, as you mentioned, $10 billion uh, in the last three months. And after today's number of nearly 12,000 crores on the block deals, uh, that number goes up uh, even more. Uh, so it's a function of India's growth, uh, all the factors that you listed, what uh, Devina mentioned. Uh, I think uh, it's a a combination of all that. What do we do from here? Uh, you know, my friend was quite circumspect uh, uh, in a sense of, uh, you know, uh, topish markets, or are they just making one more round and setting the stage for now taking off after 18 months of being sideways markets? So uh, that's a big debate. I think the ones who have made the most money are the SIP. Uh, holders, the retail Indian investors who keep on investing 12 to 14,000 crores month on month. HNIs have missed out. Uh, HNIs are always uh, over analyzing, and FIs have actually uh, made it a habit of coming in uh, near the topping uh, market. So uh, they've become more momentum players. Again, that's a very crude generalization I'm making. There are different types of FIs and uh, you know of course it's not true but as uh, if you see it as a breed I think the domestic retail SIP holder is the most smartest uh, person today because they mm. keep investing fixed amounts uh, topish markets or is it just setting uh, a stage for moving higher uh, that's a big debate. Uh, my vote would be that uh, India will outperform, will continue to outperform. We have the growth, we have the flows, uh, we have the economy, uh, but we will be also dependent on what's happening globally, uh, which is not looking too bad. We are near the end right. of the central bank hiking cycle. Uh, so few tough months, but then uh, we should see better clarity in okay. 2020. I'm going to come back to that question, though. Uh, on whether markets are a barometer for the economy because uh, they are very often clubbed together. But meanwhile, let me come to what you should do. And I have with me Monica Halland. Thank you, for, Monica, for joining us today. She's the author of Let's Talk Money. She has a new book out saying Let's Talk Mutual Funds. And that's truly the gateway for, I would say, most Indians to expose themselves to the markets and years and years of sort of uh, education, education initiatives have now convinced people that they should put their hard on money, or at least some of it, in mutual funds. What do these new highs mean for them? Tamanna, it was an absolute dis delight to hear Ajay talk about the fact that it is the Indian retail investor with her SIPs, the boring old product, who has actually made money in this particular run-up. So obviously, we've done something right with the market with investor education. And I want to say that, uh, I mean, Devina spoke about the fact that, you know, don't wait too long, uh, don't invest when the market tops out. I just did some back of the envelope numbers. And I want to read, I want to talk about the unluckiest investor ever in India, who on a 52-week high buys the Sensex starting 1992 and goes on doing it every year for 20 years. Okay, so there's a un Mr. Unlucky. Every year when the Sensex hits 52-week high, he happens to buy worth 1 lakh rupees. For 20 years, he's put in 20 lakh. Now, 11 years after that, 2024, how much do you think this person has? He's the unluckiest investor ever. This person is sitting on 2.11 crore. 20 lakh for the unluckiest investor has grown to 2.11 crore. So I just rest my case that there for a retail investor who is not a trader, who's not a speculator, who's not a, a future and option trader, but is a regular professional who has month on month income, month on month savings, needs not to be out of the market at all. You, the only thing you control is your asset allocation, and that becomes a trigger 
to either redeem or to buy or to update that asset class. This timing of the market for retail is a message that absolutely should not go out at all. Every time is a good time for a long-term Indian investor. That's the only message I want to give all of the people who are watching today saying that I lost out. You know, you said the same thing when markets were at 4,000, at 8,000, at 12,000, at 25,000, at 40,000, at 50, at 60. Markets yes. make high. Since the time they were constructed, the value of the index is 100, starting value, right? So it starts from there and it will go on making highs. The number means nothing. Please understand, it means nothing. It is the underlying value of the market. And that Samana, comes to your question of, you know, whether it's an indication of the economy, of the confidence of the people. And, you know, in my opinion, I think it is. It is mm. the markets look forward. Um, I think they are also riding on a lot of liquidity from domestic plus foreign investors. But inherently, the strength, the markets are forward looking. So in a certain way, yes, they do indicate the positive uh, uh, expectations of Indian industrialists, corporates and investors on the market. But my message only to the investors is do not bother about Sensex Nifty values. You please continue <laughs> doing your SIPs. You are the winners. Yeah. You beaten FII's hollow. So you should celebrate. Okay, so it's it's a feel good factor more than anything else. It's a feel good factor. Ajay Bhaga is giving you a clap in case you can't see it, Monica. Is is very you know, he's he's appreciating it. Okay, Devina Mera, the question about what it means uh, in terms of representing the growth of India, the growth trajectory. Very simply put, of course, it means your top thirty and your top fifty companies are expected to have more profits, to do better. Uh, and that will happen if there is economic growth. Should we see it as simply as that? Or are there too many factors influencing these numbers that makes it difficult uh, to draw a straight line between markets and economy? Oh, I think I've so lost her feed there. Devina, I'm going to have to fix your. I'm going to have to fix your feed and then come back to you. I can. I can't quite hear you. Let me come back to Ajay Bagga. Meanwhile, on you know uh, whether you want to take another stab at that question and also <laughs> what should people do right now? Frankly, a lot of those yeah. watching would be saying that it's a very good thing. But what do we do? If uh, we should not have FOMO, fear of missing out should not uh, be there. Uh, there are enough buses going every day. There are enough trains leaving every day. So it's not that. What is risky, Tamanna? What is happening? Today I was asked to quote on uh, uh, one article somebody uh, was writing and they asked my views that uh, micro caps are the way to go now to uh, go for multi-baggers. And I, I came back to quality and to invest regularly. I said those are the only two things that work timing the market, trying to pick out those thousand baggers. Very few people actually are able to do that. Maybe uh, it's a hundred people uh, worldwide uh, who are successful in that. And uh, definitely uh, most of us are not part of that uh, hundred. Devina is, uh, I know that uh, from experience, but uh, not too many. Uh, why I was applauding uh, Monica, because she gave with clarity, she gave the answer. Uh, people have to focus back on their particular goals, allocate based on that. You know, we are sitting now where government of India bonds are giving you 7%. Uh, but what is being sold today, Tamanna? 15% SME uh, paper in the uh, uh, AIF uh, scenario. And people are lapping it up. Where banks are not able to do a good credit job in SME lending, you are going to very thinly populated AIFs and giving them a lot of money at 15% yields. That story ends very badly. I can write that today and uh, get back to you in two years' time. Uh, so mm. investing consistently, economy and markets are linked, but uh, they don't move in lockstep. Actually, the market bottoms much before the recession bottoms. Same way the market starts getting up, before the recession starts seeing the curve going up. 
So there is a lag time between the economy and the markets, but the flows are determined on the expectation of the economy and the growth of the earnings. Over to Devina, she is the master on this. Okay, Devina, we've got your we've got your connection uh, uh, back, and uh, you know, yeah. coming to you with that two two part question: markets and economy, are they the same thing? Are they indicate? Oh, clearly not the same thing, but are they indicative of each other? Okay. Okay. First of all, I mean, uh, Monica said exactly what I was saying that. Uh, uh, there's a risk to not being invested. So, you know, that okay. that's, that is often the bigger risk in the market rather than the risk of uh, being invested and seeing a loss. So that, that uh, part uh, is uh, true. And uh, what Ajay was saying about multi-baggers, there's actually no investor in the world who has a portfolio of only multi-baggers. So let's get that myth out of the picture. Warren Buffett says that in 70 years of investing, a dozen uh, uh, investments have accounted for most of his returns. So, you know, that no one has a magic wand. So don't look for somebody with a magic wand. You have a systematic way of asset allocation and a systematic way of investing within that asset allocation, especially for equities. So that, that apart on the economy versus market thing, Actually, there can be very big leads, lags, completely, you know, out of whack for long periods of time. And the Chinese economy being a good example, it, it reached a high in 2007, which it didn't see for the next 15 years, even as its economy went up six, seven times. So that kind of disconnect can happen. There are obviously leads and lags. Last year in October, when I said that, you know, the, the first three quarters have been a disaster globally. And from now on, especially the U.S. market begins to look good. People said, but you're still forecasting a recession in the U.S. I said, but it is already in the price. So if there, there, there is a link between the economy and the market. But as a lay person, you will not be able to extrapolate from one to the other. And there are very yeah. significant leads, lags at the very least. And as I said, you know, that disconnect can go on for years and decades. So we cannot see, we, we all like stories. Human beings like <laughs> stories. So we like a narrative yes. that the market is up because of one, two, three, four, five. If the market was down, you would have found another narrative to yeah, yeah. Uh, say that. And, and for example, you know, all of... Uh, uh, all TV uh, spends a lot of time uh, looking at FII flows, but if you look at FII flows versus how the market moves over a longer term, every month, every quarter, every year, there's actually no correlation. We tried it for a long time and I, I don't even track FII flows anymore because there is no linkage. So, okay. That's so, so, so oh, let's let's come let's come to brass tacks. So, what should people do? Because sometimes, sometimes after markets go up, uh, a lot of the big investors tend to, um, you know, we call it book profits. They they tend to sell, and then markets go down, and you have the retail investors or the mutual fund investors who suddenly see the value of their portfolio dwindling and start getting a bit stressed out. So, uh, Devina, what's your advice for them right now? My advice is to stay invested if you are invested and if you are sitting on the fence and have not invested what you think should be your equity allocation, please invest. So it's pretty simple. It, you know, as I said, in March, I had tweeted that with no ifs and buts, nothing like that, saying that you know, if you are not invested your equity allocation, please invest. It's up 11, 12% from there, but still it's not a bad time. Okay. Uh, Monica, you know, just closing remarks from you, and, and I know the advice will be in the same vein, so I'm going to ask you a different question. Your commentary on the sort of awakening of the average Indian to the potential of markets, and we ran some of those figures earlier. Frankly, it's still a small percentage of the population that puts their money in markets. People largely in India still either put it in their savings accounts, their fixed deposits, they buy gold, land, etc. Do you think that this is changing soon enough? Tamanna, I think it's a new generation. Uh, people of my generation grew up in a socialist country where government controlled everything. We did not even understand market risk properly. But the millennials and Gen Z were born in an economically free country 
their perception of risk is very different. So I think a lot of their risk appetite is translating into the numbers that we are seeing. And that's a very good thing because they cannot target their large retirement portfolios by getting risk-free returns on deposits. So they have no option but to get an equity exposure. And the good thing is because of a whole lot of market reform which SEBI has done and a lot of push on investor education, I think India is one of those unique markets when retail investors actually win rather than play the wrong end of the market year after year, time after time. So my only message to investors is do not think you're a speculator. You are an investor. You are a long-term investor in equity and behave like that. Do not chase either categories or uh, winning schemes in a particular year. You look for the schemes that work for you and then get committed to them. You know, it's almost like finding the right partner. You find your set of schemes. They are the ones and you stay with them. Okay, so it's a good uh, time to be invested. It's a good time to start investing. And anyway, it's good news all around if markets hit new highs. Doesn't mean that everything is hunky-dory. Doesn't mean it will always go in one direction. But yes, more and more Indians are opening up to this option to at least, at the very least, beat inflation. Thank you to all of you for joining us on the special show this evening where we talk about the big headline. We're going to take a short break and on the other side, the Karnataka government has decided to give people cash instead of five kilograms of rice as an interim measure under the Anya Bhagya scheme. We come back with more on that.